14. I've had a, a, a hoarse voice uh, all week. I barely made it through the services on Sunday. <clears throat> and uh, I didn't make it Wednesday. But I'm by faith going to make it all weekend. So here we go. Revelation chapter 14. We're going to begin in verse 9. The title of our message tonight is God's Promise of Rest. <clears throat> And I think what I'm going to do is ask them to turn me up just a little bit, and then I'll try to talk quieter. How's that? Let's pray. Lord, thank you so much. <clears throat> Your words bless our hearts, and so we come tonight with just a desire to have your spirit minister to us through your word. And so we pray this now in the name of Jesus, our Lord and Savior. Amen. I want to first begin by mentioning um, what I think some of you, or maybe a lot of you, saw in the news this week uh, that the United States is now going to be officially recognizing Jerusalem uh, as the capital of Israel. Yeah, let's give, yes, amen. And we'll be moving the embassy from Tel Aviv, where it has been all these years, to Jerusalem over the next several years. Now, this is very, very important, and uh, it has an impact um, spiritually, of course, politically, it's going to have a major impact, but it has a spiritual implication in the latter day events and the fulfillment of biblical prophecy. But first, before we discuss that, I think it would be good to have a little history uh, of that 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 uh, particular situation. So, first of all, um, if you're not familiar, but on May fourteenth, nineteen forty-eight. Um, David Ben-Gurion, the Prime Minister of Israel, declared on that date that Israel was officially a state again. And that was a monumental day. Now, the United States, under uh, President Harry Truman, um, recognized the state of Israel first. In fact, Truman had told his, uh, his, his uh, staff, I don't care what time of the day or night it is, when that announcement is made, you alert me uh, that I, I want to make sure that the United States is first to recognize Israel. They woke him up at uh, four or five in the morning and he rushed down there and made the declaration. And as part of that, uh, the establishment of a, an embassy, which is of course very common, but it was a setup in Tel Aviv, which is a, a city west of Jerusalem near to the uh, Mediterranean. Now, when David Ben-Gurion made that proclamation for the formation of the state of Israel on May 14th, 1948, immediately, upon that statement, immediately six Arab nations declared war on Israel. I mean, they were not even one day old as a nation, and six well-established uh, Arab nations with well-established military and air force attacked. And they did not just declare war, they implemented war. Now, leading up to that, because it was well anticipated that Israel was going to make this statement, leading up to that, now this is very important, the, those Arab nations wanted to clear the battlefield of Arabs. And so they, they sent word for Palestinian Arabs living in that area to remove themselves, to clear the, the, the pathway of the tanks and the armies so that to minimize Arab casualties. And so 800,000 Palestinians withdrew into these temporary camps. The anticipation is that they would only be in those camps a few weeks. Because no one of the Arab nations, none of the Arab nations in their uh, wildest imaginations thought that Israel would actually survive, let alone be victorious in that battle. And so those 800,000 then um, found themselves outside of the state of Israel. They became what is now today known as the Palestinian refugees. There are now today 4.3 million uh, Palestinian refugees, and that is the primary background. There are other issues around that, but that's the, the simplest explanation for how we arrived at the 
modern Palestinian problem today. Now, when those six Arab nations attacked Israel, they actually advanced. They only had a very small sliver of land along the coast. But they advanced inland and even took the western part of Jerusalem. They had no place, no foot in Jerusalem till that point. So because of that war, they advanced and took western Jerusalem. Then 1967, again, Arab nations uh, were amassed on the border. And they were making no um, mistake about it. They were communicating very, very clearly they were going to attack uh, Israel. And so Israel uh, implemented a preemptive strike, a preemptive war, and uh, knocked out the Egyptian Air Force in one day. And it was the famous 1967 Six-Day War. Six days. Uh, in fact, somebody gave me an original Life magazine from 1967 uh, um, uh, highlighting that amazing... I have an original, uh, which is really special to me. Anyway, uh, because of the 1967 war, they then advanced further and took all of Jerusalem and, and the surrounding areas. Now, there is where the, the dispute now arises. Because the, the, the concept of a two-state solution, Israel and Palestine, both being a state, uh, requires a capital. And of course, uh, Jerusalem has long claimed Israel, uh, Jerusalem to be their capital. Well, the Palestinians claim Eastern Jerusalem, which uh, was in the hands of Jordan, uh, up till the 67 war, they claimed that to be their location for their capital. Eastern Jerusalem, by the way, includes the Temple Mount and the Al-Aqsa Mosque and the Dome of the Rock. When you look at a picture of Israel and you see that golden dome, that's the Dome of the Rock shrine. That's not a mosque, that's a shrine. And um, so they, there is where the dispute lies. And so when the United States makes the declaration that they're recognizing Jerusalem, they didn't say Western Jerusalem, they said Jerusalem as the capital of Israel. That is why the Arab nations around the world, and frankly, uh, uh, pretty much all the nations of the world disagree with this move. And so the United States finds itself alone alongside of Israel in, in making this move, uh, but it has spiritual implications as well. Here's the spiritual significance. It demonstrates that Jerusalem is in fact the center of world events in the latter days. Now this is, is very important. What's happening now is going to lead into it. This is actually, uh, in, in many ways, kind of a monumental move. Because it unites the nations of the world against Israel and against the United States. And it sets the stage for a world leader to arise who is then going to uh, negotiate a settlement, negotiate peace between Israel and the nations of the world. Now, part of that covenant of peace, we can anticipate then seeing the political landscape could include the partitioning of Jerusalem so that the Palestinian Arabs could have a portion of East Jerusalem to establish a capital. We believe the Antichrist would negotiate for this. And it could also include the partitioning of the area known as the Temple Mount. That area could be partitioned so that the al Mosque and the uh, Dome of the Rock could be uh, given into the hands of the Palestinians, and an area adjacent and to the north could be then allowed uh, to Israel for the rebuilding of the temple. And so the partitioning of Jerusalem would perhaps include the partitioning of what is known then as the Temple Mount. Now, as we understand from prophecy of Scripture, the Antichrist 
who negotiates this covenant, we believe it includes the partitioning of Israel, or excuse me, of Jerusalem. You see the significance of Jerusalem now. And so this, this negotiated truce, or covenant of peace, as the scripture calls it, will only last three and a half years. Because the Antichrist will betray Israel. And he will take the temple that he had negotiated for them to be able to build. And foreseeably, it would take them about three or three and a half years to build the temple. He would take it back. And, now this is an important thing. In fact, if you've already opened your Bibles to Revelation 14, would you mind turning left to chapter 11, Revelation 11, and look at something uh, with me, if you would, because it has relevance to what we're seeing now on the political landscape. Because when the Antichrist betrays Israel, we understand that it's the taking back of the temple, but what we need to also see is that it includes the taking back of the entire city of Jerusalem. He will renege on his, uh, his agreement and he will take the entire city. Now let me show you this. In Revelation chapter 11, we begin reading in verse one. There was given to me a measuring rod like a staff and someone said, rise and measure the temple of God and the altar and those who worship in it, but leave out the court which is outside the temple. Do not measure it. For it has been given to the nations and they will tread underfoot the holy city for 42 months, which is three and a half years according to the Jewish calendar. And so they will tread the entire city underfoot. So the betrayal of Israel has to be recognized uh, in light of not just the temple, but the city. Now, the significance of that city and the possession of that city, now we begin to see the, the significance of that on the world scene. And we are seeing now those uh, elements being set forth that lead to the revealing of the Antichrist in the latter days. So I wanted to give us the spiritual significance as well as the historic significance of what is happening with this announcement because it is not a small matter. This is a major thing that is happening now on the world scene and we are seeing history unfold and we are seeing prophecy unfolding before our very eyes. This is a day of spiritual battle. And so we need to recognize that. And let's turn to our regular study now in Revelation 14 as we begin in verse 9. Because in Revelation uh, 14, we're, we're seeing the spiritual background because at this point, uh, this, is, this is after the Antichrist has arised, uh, arise, uh, arisen on the scene. And he, remember from my message last week that he causes the mark of the beast the Antichrist is known also as the beast here. The mark of the beast, which is the name of the Antichrist or the number of his name. Let the one who is wise calculate or count the number, which is 666. So we see the spiritual warfare behind these events, but these, the spiritual warfare has real consequences for those who stand with the Antichrist, then take this mark of this beast on the back of the hand or on the forehead without which they cannot buy or sell. It has real consequences. But there will be those who stand with Jesus and they stand for the gospel during that terrible uh, time of tribulation. And we saw earlier in chapter 14, 144,000 Jewish witnesses who are believers in Jesus Christ. And what we understand is that there will be other overcomers because the gospel is preached. See, one, one of the things we saw, an angel with the everlasting gospel declaring the gospel to every nation, tribe, and tongue, even during the tribulation. So there are others who come to faith in Christ. They will be living through the most difficult time in human history. But like, 
You know, it's interesting because when there are times of battle or persecution or difficulty, oftentimes that's when the church is like for real. Like there, there's no games, right? It's like, there's, there's no, it, that's not the time for games. Like that's the time for real. When, it, when, it, when, it, when, when it, everything is like falling apart and, it, and, and life is like at its worst, then you know whether it's real or not. I tell you what, the church in China is real. See, that, that's important to recognize. The church that's in Iran, though it is hidden and underground, I tell you what, it's real. There's no games in the church of Iran, though it's well hidden. But we have an Iranian pastor who is actually knowledgeable and in touch, and he can tell you it's for real. And so that's the thing. In the tribulation, people come to faith in Christ and it's for real. There's no games. See, and that's and really what we need to see. We need to see that ourselves so that we can have a real faith. Like this is the time for our faith to be real. See, now, now's the time. We're seeing the landscape change. We're seeing the world. We're seeing things unfold before our eyes. Now's the time to be real. This is not the time to play games anymore. Time to be real. And that's what we understand when we look at these. And, and, and these overcomers are given this promise. God promises them rest. Now, I want us to look at that. We're going to look at that tonight. But the word rest, when you see that in the scriptures, it means far more, far more than what we in our uh, limited English can understand. It, it is a deep, spiritually deep topic that goes all the way back to Genesis and runs all the way through the entire uh, Bible. And you can do an amazing study on it, just the idea of what God means when he uses the word rest. It's far, far more than what we think of in our English minds. Let's read it. Uh, Revelation 14, I begin in verse nine. Another angel, a third one, followed them, saying with a loud voice, if anyone worships the beast, that's the Antichrist, and his image, and receives this mark on his forehead or upon his hand, he also will drink of the wine of the wrath of God, which is mixed in full strength in the cup of his anger, and he, the one who takes his mark, will be tormented with fire and brimstone, in the presence of the holy angels and in the presence of the Lamb. And the smoke of their torment goes up forever and ever, and they will have no rest day and night, those who worship the beast and his image, and whoever receives this mark of his name. Now, here is the perseverance of the saints. He's talking here about the saints, those who receive the gospel in the most difficult tribulation, most difficult time on the face of the earth, they receive the gospel. Here is the perseverance of those saints who keep the commands of God and their faith in Jesus. And I heard a voice from heaven saying, write this down. I just, I just love the power of what he just said. Write this down. Because this is important. Write this down. Blessed are the dead who die in the Lord from now on. Yes, says the Spirit, that they may rest. Here's this word. And it means far more than to have a sleep. That they may rest from their labors, for their deeds follow with them. Then I looked, and behold, a white cloud, and sitting on the cloud was one like a son of man, having a golden crown on his head and a sharp sickle in his hand. And another angel came out of the temple crying out with a loud voice to him who sat on the cloud, put in your sickle and reap because the hour to reap has come because the harvest of the earth is ripe. Now, uh, we'll talk about this more on Wednesday, but, and we're gonna read more verses here, but the, uh, as Jesus gave this picture, the wheat and the tares, they grow up together. And there is a great harvest and they are separated at the end of the age. See, the harvest of the earth is ripe. 
And he who sat on the cloud swung his sickle over the earth, and the earth was reaped. And another angel came out of the temple, which is in heaven, and he also had a sharp sickle. And another angel, the one who has power over fire, came out from the altar, and he called out with a loud voice to him who had the sharp sickle, saying, put in your sharp, sharp sickle and gather the clusters of the vine of the earth, because her grapes are ripe. And the angel swung his sickle to the earth and gathered the clusters from the vine of the earth and threw them in the great winepress of the wrath of God. Ever heard that phrase? The winepress of the wrath of God comes right from here. And the winepress was trodden outside the city and blood came out from the winepress up to the horse's bridles for a distance of 200 miles, which is a... a Tragic thought, splashing, not as deep as, but a splashing up to. So these are the verses I want us to look at and recognize a lot of spiritual truths. First of all, in this world, you'll have many troubles, right? Now, the recognition of that we see, of course, in this period of time. But right now, the world, frankly, is filled with troubles. Jesus recognized that. When, when he said, Jesus frankly said, in this world, you will have many troubles, and in fact, if you name the name of Jesus Christ, you will have more troubles in this world. Because Jesus said, if they, if they despise me, will they also not despise you? If they resist me, will they also not you? And so he said, but take courage, I have overcome the world. Take courage. What does that mean to take courage? It means to have faith, strong faith. Strengthen your faith, man. And so Jesus recognized the trouble of this world in another place when he says, come unto me, all you who are weary and heavy laden. He's speaking of a troubled soul. And you will find rest. You'll find rest for your souls. There's a, anyone who's lived in this world very long will tell you that this world is broken. This is a broken world. And, and many people are beaten down by it. Spiritually and emotionally beaten down. This is a broken world. And so... Well, he's reckon, Jesus is recognizing something very, very important when it comes to the soul. Because lack of rest torments the soul. This is important for us to recognize the value, the significance of the soul. Now, those who received the mark of the beast in those days, well, at first think it was, you know, hey, that was convenient. Life is better now. I mean, I can buy and sell. I can do life, you know, and it, that was, it was, I'm and better now. It was a good thing I did that. But see, but they have chosen, they've made a choice there to choose with the side of evil. See, verse 11 tells us, back in Revelation 14, verse 11, the smoke of their torment goes up forever and ever and they have no rest day or night, those who worship the beast in his image. They've chosen the side of evil. And the, the end result of that is that rest, the lack of rest. And he's speaking, uh, of, of course, to the soul. Now, physical, the lack of physical rest it's painful too. You know, one of the, one of the uh, tortures of prisoners of war uh, that they have done in other countries for many years is the depriving of sleep, depriving of rest. And, and if, you, if you don't have enough rest, it, it's excruciatingly difficult and painful. I remember one time, and which is nothing in comparison, but I had some big project that I was committed to, and I went like three days without any real sleep. I had a, a little nap, of about 40 minute nap in the morning, and I went three days without any sleep. And I'll tell you the end result of it was uh, I was cranky, I was worn down, I was irritable, I was unhappy, and I was error prone. But you see, the, it just wears you down. That's the physical. That's the physical. But the, the emotional, the spiritual, the soul that has no rest is in even greater anguish. If you've ever messed up in life, then perhaps you've tasted of the soul that is in anguish. Because the soul that is in anguish is in deep pain. And so this is important to recognize what we're speaking to here is the value of the soul. See, a lot of people don't recognize the value of the soul. In fact, one of the great lies of the enemy, frankly, 
one of the great lies of the enemy is to try to convince you that your life does not matter, that you have no value. If he can make your life of no consequence, even to yourself, he has won a great victory. It is a lie from, can we say it boldly? It's a lie from the pit of hell. Because Jesus has a very different word about the value of your soul. Mark 8, uh, verses 35 to 37, who wishes to save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake will save it. For what does it profit a man to gain the whole world, but to forfeit his soul? What would a man give in exchange for his soul? See, what is Jesus speaking to? The value of your soul. See, Satan knows very well the value of your soul, which, which is why spiritual battle is for your soul. He very much knows the, the, the significance of your soul, but he is a liar. He's been a liar from the very beginning, and so if he can convince you that you are of no count, that your soul is worth nothing, that you are worth nothing, that you have no value whatsoever, he has won a great victory. Do not allow him to have that victory. Because Jesus paid a great price to redeem your soul. How valuable is your soul? Jesus died. The very son of the living God died on the cross of Calvary that your soul might be redeemed. That's how valuable your soul is. God loves you so much that he gave his only begotten son. That's how valuable your soul is. God sent his only son to go and get you and bring you to himself. That's how valuable your soul is. See, don't allow the enemy to have that victory. That's the whole point. Because here's what we gotta see. Your soul was made for God. Your soul was made by God for God. See, those who received the mark of the beast will at first think they made the right decision. Things are better. But they've chosen the side of evil. And they have not considered the consequence. What are they doing? They're only thinking about the moment. They're only thinking about today. They're only thinking about the convenience of being able to have some kind of comfort in this life, you know, to buy and sell. And to have their stuff. But they're not thinking about the, the consequences of that decision. You choose the side of evil, you, you've got a date with the devil. You make a date with the devil, and I'll tell you what, it will be fun at the beginning. Is this not true? You make a date with the devil, it will be fun in the beginning, and it will bite you in the end. And it will be very, very painful. And see, that's what we have to recognize. Jesus is wanting us to see through these words, to consider, to consider the value of your soul, and consider what we're doing. Is this thing helping my soul? Will it disturb my soul within me? When people reject God and live for themselves, they discover, they will discover that is an error because there's a great price to exclude God who made your soul is, is to bring a great price. See, now is the time to choose, right? I'm gonna read something that C.S. Lewis wrote in a book called Mere Christianity, but he writes it so well, I just wanna read it. God, C.S. Lewis, God is going to invade this earth in force, but what is the good of saying that you're on his side then? When you can see the whole natural universe melting away like a dream and something else, something it never entered your mind to conceive comes crashing in, something so beautiful to some and so terrible to others that none of us will have a choice left. For this time, it will be God without disguise, something so overwhelming that it will strike either irresistible love or irresistible horror into every creature. It will be too late then to choose your side. There is no use saying that you choose to lie down when it has become impossible to stand up. That will not be the time for choosing. That will be the time when you discover which side you've already chosen, whether you realized it before or not. Now, today, this moment is our chance to choose the right side. God is holding back to give us that chance. It will not last forever. Take it or leave it. That is powerfully written because he just calls it straight out. And see, he's speaking 
in Revelation 14, he's speaking rest. The concept of rest is so significant. Rest is both a promise and a reward. And we have to grasp how large of a word that is. There's a great contrast in these verses here between those who trust in God and persevere in times of trouble and those who choose a side of evil and reject the Lord. What a, what a great contrast. You see it before us. There's eternal consequences to our decisions. See, the promise of rest is far beyond what many might conceive. Because many times when people think of heaven, they have, they have a, a, a very small view of it, frankly. Uh, you know, many people think, well, what is heaven like? Oh, they think of all the pleasures of earth, you know, like times two or something, you know. It's a place where, Oh, the, the, the lakes are pristine and they're full of fish and you can fish all day, you know, or something. Or the golf courses are just magnificent and, you know, the, the, it, you can golf and it's just marvelous. Or, or, you know, you lay on the beach sipping a drink with a little umbrella in it, you know, and servers come serving you. You know, we were just on this, uh, many of us took this um, Footsteps of Paul Cruz, and we, you know, we're in Greece, and we went to Israel, and then Malta, and Rome, and, and uh, you know, the fact that it was a cruise um, meant that we had all the, you know, blessings of, if you've ever done a cruise, you know that it is an amazing opportunity to get spoiled, you, you know, and in fact, you come, you come back from a cruise, it's like, well, who's going to make my bed now? I mean, where, where's the buffet that's open all day long, you know? And you, you, you kind of get that, well, maybe heaven's like that, you know, where you're just going to be treated and treated and wonderfully treated and, and spoiled and blessings come to you. It misses the whole point of heaven. It misses the whole point of heaven. The whole point of heaven is the presence of God himself. See, that, that, is a, that is a joy inexpressible. You know, when we think now, the scripture says that we have the Holy Spirit in part, in part, like a down payment, earnest money, you might say. And, and have you ever, in this life that we're living now, have you ever experienced the Holy Spirit in such a, a, an overwhelmingly beautiful, just overflowing way, like the presence of God? Wouldn't you say, wouldn't you say that those, those experiences of God are far beyond any other experiences of this world? I mean, wouldn't you agree with me that it's better than a golf game? Right? I love to golf, but I'll tell you what, it's nothing in comparison to the filling of the Holy Spirit in your life. Isn't that true? And so the, the understanding is, here's my point. Oh, but that's just the down payment. See, in heaven, you have the Holy Spirit in full. My cup overflows, David said. Well, that will be very true. Your soul will be alive because the Holy Spirit in the very presence of God will fill your life. I love Revelation 21, which we're going to get there fairly soon. I saw no temple, and he's describing this new Jerusalem that comes out of heaven. I saw no temple in it, for the Lord God, the Almighty, and the Lamb are its temple, and the city has no need of sun or moon to shine on it, for the glory of God has illumined it, and the lamp is the Lamb. Like, that's what makes it magnificent. So what is he telling us here? He's telling us, blessed are those who persevere. He's giving us this encouragement. You see, this, this is coming. What a reward, what a blessing. Blessed are those who persevere. We saw the 144,000, when he's writing about the faithfulness of those who come to faith in the tribulation. Now, they persevere in the most difficult period in the history of the world. God is, God is pleased that's why he says they're blessed. God is pleased with their steadfast faith. They got steadfast faith 
even in the midst of all this trouble. See, Hebrews eleven six. without faith it's impossible to please him, for he who comes to God must believe that he is and that he is the rewarder of those who seek him. That's what pleases the Lord. When he sees faith, that's the life. When he sees faith, that's real. When he sees faith, that's genuine. That's when God is pleased. These believers in the tribulation, they show this faith in extreme trial. And God is exceptionally pleased. They persevere in difficulty. They trust God with all faith. The favor of God is on them. The favor of God is on them. Even though they're going through trouble, the favor of God is on them. Now, see, that is a difficult concept for many people to get right there. It's a very difficult concept for many people to get that the favor of God is on them though they're going through trouble. A lot of people say, that doesn't compute to me. I don't understand that. If the favor of God was on them, then why are they going through the trouble? Well, Jesus said, in this world you will have many troubles, but take courage, I have overcome the world. You can have the favor of God on you and still be going through a troublesome, broken down, evil filled world. The favor of God is on you because your soul is so valuable to the Lord and he has adopted you as a son or as a daughter. His love is everlasting and therefore the favor of God rests on you. And I hope that you see many, many examples of that. Even in trouble, God, God give me with you. I remember just a silly example of it, but for me it was a pretty big uh, deal. I was, we were doing something here in the sanctuary way up high and uh, we have uh, an extension ladder that's like really, really super long extension ladder. And uh, so I was trying to put it, uh, put it away and I had it sitting straight up like this, balancing it, you know, and I'm trying to lower, you know how an extension ladder works, right? There's two ladders and you lower the second one, right? And then, right. So I, I have, it's way up there like this and I'm trying to lower it down and it comes out of, the rope comes out of my hand. And so the top, ladder comes flying down and smashes my hand. That's, thank you. And it, I mean, it, it smashed my hand and it didn't hurt. I'm telling you the truth. You say, well, how is that possible? I was sitting there thinking the same thing because I'm holding it and it just smashed my hand. And I'm thinking, how is that possible? That is not hurting my hand. And then I realized my ring, my ring took the entire blunt of the thing on it and it, the ring saved me. Her love <laughs> saved me. But I was... Now, the ring was smashed. You know, I had to get some pliers to open them up and took them to the jeweler to get it fixed. But it saved me. And I thought, you know what, God, you, can you just imagine that smashed hand? I mean, the pain of that, they couldn't play the, the, the keys. I couldn't, I couldn't worship you, God. But the, the little things, the little things, just the favor of God, I remember there's this story I read of a, uh, of a captain of a ship, George Mueller, you might know him from history, uh, a, famous, uh, a famous believer of Christ, George Mueller in England, and he was on the ship. And uh, Mueller was famous for his faith, actually, for trusting God, but the ship was wrapped in fog and could not move. And so Mueller came to the captain and said, I have to make this appointment in Quebec. Just coming across. It's impossible, replied the captain. Impossible. You see how thick this fog is? It is impossible. So George Mueller said, well, then I will pray. Then I will pray that God will lift this fog. And so he began to pray. Very simple prayer. The captain, an unbelieving captain, decided that, that he would also pray. And George Mueller stopped him. As you do not believe, 
God will not answer, there is no need for you to pray. And he walked away. Because he understood something about faith. It's about believing. Faith is about believing. And so he stopped the man from praying because he wanted him to connect the two together because Mueller prayed and he believed. And by the way, the fog immediately lifted. It's well recorded in history. It's a wonderful story. See, these verses in Revelation 14 are given to us here to strengthen our faith. And then he says something interesting in verse 13. Blessed are those who die in the Lord. Blessed are those who die in the Lord. What an interesting phrase. But he adds the, 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 the expression, blessed are they in, who die in the Lord from now on. Why did he add those words from now on? Hasn't it always been true that those who die in the Lord are blessed? Yes, it's always been true. I have stood by many gravesides and done many graveside services and reminded everyone of that great truth written in Revelation 14. Blessed are they who die in the Lord. But John says from now on, because these are believers who have come to faith in the tribulation. And he wants to encourage them. You did not, you, it's not too late for you. You did not miss the resurrection. Because that, that would be their fear. I've missed the rapture. I've missed the, re, I've missed the resurrection. It's too late for me. It's not too late for you. That's what he's, it's not too late for you. That's what he's saying. And the key is understanding that we are blessed. See, we, we understand death very differently than the Lord does. We look at de death very differently than the Lord does. Because we, we have a difficulty with the, 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 the concept of dying. See, but for God, well, what does the scripture say? Psalm 116, verse 15. Precious in the sight of the Lord is the death of his godly ones. It's like, it's like Enoch. Enoch, you know, the scripture says, walked with God and was no more. I mean, he just, he walked with God. That's how he lived his life. He walked with God. And then at the end of his life, he, he, he just, he walked with God and he just kept on walking. It's like, welcome, my good and faithful servant. It's like, you just keep on walking. It's like, oh, it's graduation day. Like it's a glory day. It's like a, a day of celebration in heaven. Here comes, here comes a godly one. Here comes a saint. So welcome him home. Well done. Well done. See, we, we have to understand the rest that he is telling us. Is, there's a far bigger concept to this. Romans 14 gives it the right perspective. If we live, we live for the Lord. If we die, we die for the Lord. Take that and write that on your heart. Because when things get really bad in this world, that's a great thing to remember right there. If we live, we live for the Lord. If we die, we die for the Lord. It, there's a movie coming out next, um, next spring uh, about when hijackers hijacked a plane that left Tel Aviv. And the hijackers uh, insisted that it be flown to Entebbe, Uganda. You remember this out of history? It's a, a real story. And the, the hijackers separated the Jews. They separated the Jews from the non-Jews. And it was very clear that those who were Jews were being separated at risk of life. And what was interesting, what was interesting is that there were several people who volunteered, who volunteered to join the Jews, though they were not. They made their choice. Oh, you're separating us? Count me over there. 
Because I, I, I just think there is something that resonates in the heart when we recognize the value of that which is honorable is greater than even death itself. To live your life with honor and glory to the Lord is greater than death itself. Romans 14, if we live, we live for the Lord. If we die, we die for the Lord. Therefore, whether we live or whether we die, we are the Lord's. For to this end, Christ died and lived again, that he might be Lord both of the dead and of the living. And therefore, what we need to recognize is that God wants us to live our lives fully unto the Lord. Because when you live your life fully unto the Lord, your soul is alive. And if your soul is alive, you are living. And that's what God wants to live. Jesus says, I've come that you have life and have it to the full. If your soul is alive, then you are really living. Let's pray. Father, I pray for all of us tonight that we would take hold of these concepts, that we would understand that you have called us to really live. Whether we live, we live for the Lord. If we die, we die for the Lord. Whether we live or whether we die, we are the Lord's. Church tonight, he, he's, he's asking us, will you have a faith that's real? The time for games is over. That's long past. Things are changing before our eyes. Will you have a real faith? A genuine faith? Would you say even tonight, would you say to the Lord, if I live, then I'll live for the Lord. If I die, then I'll die for the Lord. Whether I live or whether I die, I am the Lord's. Just raise your hand. Say it to the Lord. I want you to know this, Lord. I don't care whether I live or whether I die. I am the Lord's. I'm yours, Lord. Here's my heart. Here's my life. I'm yours, Lord. Let's give the Lord our praise and thanks. Father, thank you for everyone in Jesus' name who's made that statement tonight. Amen.